Good evening, everybody, and welcome. It's a wonderful opportunity to get together the wonders of Zoom that bring us to share ideas across the world. You've just seen the beginning of a talk from the Rebbe, a very powerful talk. And it's a talk, I think, that speaks to something that played very much on people's minds over many years and probably plays on our minds as well today. Everybody, I'm sure, remembers exactly where they were on 9-11. I remember for me it was a bizarre experience because I was literally standing outside the door about to enter into a meeting. And on the other side of the door, I heard people saying, oh my gosh, a plane has flown into the, into the Twin Towers. And it almost felt as if walking through that door was walking from one reality where the world had been one way into another reality where now the world was a completely different place. And if that's true, I think we'll all acknowledge that over the course of time and even in living memory, there are certain and have been certain events that totally change the world that we live in. The 6th of August, 1945 would have been one of those dates. If you can just imagine at 8.14 a.m., in Hiroshima, life was normal. People were going about their business, getting up on their way to work, collecting water, whatever it is that they were doing. And one minute later, everything changed, not only for the Japanese, but for the entire world. It was a devastating moment. What's fascinating about it, and many things are fascinating about it, but what's fascinating is some of the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project, some of the people who helped to produce the atom bomb that was going to decisively end the world war, which was an incredible thing, were so shocked and dismayed afterwards by what had happened that some of them, like Albert Einstein, became vocal opponents to the notion of nuclear weapons. It's really interesting because in 1945, December, Einstein would say, we have, with this technology, won the war, but we have not won peace. And everybody knows what happened over the next almost five decades, as there was the nuclear arms race between the East and West Bloc, the Cold War. And in an ironic way, the fact that either side had these nuclear weapons is probably what prevented an all out war because everybody knew that the stakes were too high. You know, the statistics tell us that the little boy, as it was called, the bomb on Hiroshima was actually quite inefficient. And compared to the power of subsequent atom bombs, they say that, that if, God forbid, Pakistan and, and India would go to nuclear war, and they both are nuclear powers, the devastation and fallout could affect all of us for a period of 10 years. What happened back in Hiroshima was somewhere between 70 and 80,000 fatalities in one bombing. It was unprecedented. And so the world stood by in shock and to a certain extent for a long time afterwards remained in shock at this immense power that could be unleashed. And what if it falls into the wrong hands? As somebody once said tongue in cheek about one of the U.S. presidents, that it's a scary thought to imagine that the person who holds the nuclear codes cannot pronounce nuclear. So you do worry. And the Rebbe touches on this in this talk that we've just seen from 1986 about great power in the hands of people who don't necessarily understand that power of the 12 man team who flew on the Enola, who flew on the Enola Gay to bomb Hiroshima. Only three of them had any inkling of what kind of weapon they were carrying. And even they really had no idea of what it was capable of doing. Now, classically, the Rebbe would always take everything in the world, pulling on the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov that we're supposed to learn something from everything that we witness and everything that we experience, and said there's a lesson in this, and not just a lesson about how dangerous the world could become or how fearful we should be of evil, in fact, the exact opposite. If that's the kind of power that evil carries, can you imagine if you use that power for good? So yes, we'll talk about nuclear power stations, and we'll talk about the ability of splitting the atom as a way of developing a new type of, medic of medicine and a new type of powering cities and all these wonderful things. And the Rebbe said, actually, nuclear power is you. Nuclear power is each of us. Nuclear power is the technology that the Jewish people have run on for the whole of history. And exactly in the same way as nobody understood how exactly the atom works and what it could do. And what happens when you introduce a catalyst and you split the atom and you start a chain reaction. But just because we didn't know about it didn't mean it wasn't there. Exactly the same thing as Judaism. Us, Jewish people, we are that nuclear weapon. And just as 
the atom bomb decisively ended the world war. So we're the army of God. We're Hashem's soldiers. And we're fighting a war. We're fighting a war to produce light. We're fighting a war to overcome evil. We're fighting a war to make this world a place of goodness. Hashem's garden, garden of bringing Moshiach. And that war will be decisively won when we discover the power of the technology that we have at our disposal. And what we're going to do this evening is perhaps look at one or two things in real life as we experience it. And also look at one or two things in the Torah that perhaps we read and didn't quite understand exactly what it was that we were reading. And to introduce all of that, let me tell you a story. It's a story that is, it's not uh, an amazing story, pat on your back kind of story. This happened to me, so that's why it's a good story. This is a story that recurs daily in hundreds of locations around the world. Sometimes more dramatic, sometimes less dramatic. But the message is pretty much the same. It's a story of nuclear power. And the story goes back, what, probably 30 years. I was a, a young yeshiva student. I had a good friend at the time, fellow South African, the two of us. We started uh, a little bit of a route. You know, that's how it is in the world of Chabad. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but Chabad, the minute a young boy gets to the point that he's awarded his first black fedora hat that's too big and kind of sits down just above his ears and he's peeking out like some kind of a kid in dress up for Purim, from the minute he has a pair of tefillin on it of his own, he's out there. He's a foot soldier. He's knocking on the doors of corporate America or corporate South Africa, wherever it might be, and telling the CEOs of companies, hey, you need to put a space in your diary for me every single Friday. I mean, the chutzpah is unbelievable. you got to love it. These little kids come and they, they kind of expect that the receptionist or the PA is just going to make way for them because they're here with this important mission, put tefillin on people. And on the other side, you've got the girls out there with their sharpest candles stopping people in the midst of their shopping and busy running around, in whatever it is that they're doing. Hey, stop. How's about you light sharpest candles? It's quite an incredible thing. So this friend and myself discovered in those days, for those of you who remember, in Belfour Park Shopping Center, there used to be a flea market every Sunday. It was a cute place. It was a flea market. And people used to come and they used to put up stalls. And because of the location, the proximity to the Jewish areas, so it was always full of Jewish people. Perfect place for Chabadniks to get down to business. So that's what we did. And we went and we hired our own stall at this flea market every single Sunday. We had our own stall and it was fantastic. We had tefillin and we had brochures to give out and we had Shabbos candles. And at one point, I believe, I think we even had books to sell. And that's how it was. And people would come browsing the flea market and we'd be out there and strap them up with tefillin or fix them up with a brochure or whatever the case might be. Now, some of the other stall owners were also Jewish. And one of them was a guy of similar age to us, a little bit younger than us, who would sit there every single Sunday at his parents' stall and we struck up a friendship over the course of time, and we started to put filling on with him and with his parents and with his father, his brother. And eventually, at one point in time, this friend of mine, not myself, the friend of mine, decided he's buying a pair of tzitzis for this individual, which he did. He went out, he bought him a pair of tzitzis, and he gave it to him. And that was that. Shortly afterwards, we went overseas to study, and we weren't back in the country for a few years Fast forward quite a number of years, and I come across the same family, ironically, in Belfort Park Shopping Center. And I bump into this guy. Now he looks a little different to when we last saw him. When we last saw him, he wasn't all that religious. Now I see he's got a beard. He's wearing a black hat. He's got his tzitzis out. I say, wow, that's, that's quite impressive. And he was with his mother, and the mother is so proud. She says, meet my son, the rabbi. <laughs> I was like, what? Are you serious? Your son, the rabbi? That's incredible. And he said to me, and he still remembered the name of my friend. He said, because of so-and-so who bought me that first pair of tzitzis, one thing led to another, which led to another, a chain reaction. That was the catalyst that set off a chain reaction in order to facilitate a growth of an individual who really did not have much involvement in his Judaism, who today is a rabbi here in our town. Now, that's a story that repeats itself who knows how many times around the world. The Rebbe spoke about the idea of nuclear energy as exactly that. The power is there. The atoms are there. It's not that we're creating anything. All you need is a catalyst. Catalyst that has to come into the mix. And that catalyst begins a chain reaction. I think often people look at Chabadniks who are out there chasing the single mitzvah, you know, and, and wondering if it's really worthwhile. You know, as a 
As a sustainable model, it doesn't seem like a great model. You stop people on the side of the road. You don't take the personal details. You don't hit them up for a donation. You just get a mitzvah. You never have the satisfaction, almost never, of knowing what happens next. And the Rebbe's attitude was, it doesn't make a difference. This is not conventional weaponry. Conventional weapons, you've got to know how big it is. What is the impact that it could have? But when you're dealing at the atomic level, which basically means when you go beneath the surface, when you look at what the eye cannot see, when you look deeper than what presents on the outside, then you're going to discover that inside every single one of us is this nuclear neshama. And it's that one interaction, that one moment of a mitzvah, that begins a chain reaction. And not every, in fact, most of them don't land up being where the person's a rabbi on the other side, but that's okay. Because the goal is not to turn people into rabbis, the goal is to create nuclear explosions, because that's what Jews are all about. You look in the Torah, and you read the way that Hashem describes us, the Jewish people, and you could think for a moment, you know, it doesn't sound like good news. Because Hashem tells Moshe, tell the Jewish people, Atem hameat mikol ho'amim, which most people will translate as, you're the smallest of all the nations. Ma'at, little, you're a little bit of a nation. Less than 1% of the human population, as we famously know about ourselves, or as Mark Twain put it, we're people who make up less than a quarter of 1% of the world's population. And look at the impact that the Jew has had, and everybody has it at raised eyebrow. What is it about us that we have done? And Hashem says, Atem hameat, you're the small nation. You're understated. You're tiny, almost invisible. We live in Jewish areas. But we all get surprised on occasion when we meet somebody who's never seen a Jew in their life. And statistically, that's what should happen because there's so few of us. And yet, look how much impact we have on this world. It's kind of nuclear. What Hashem was telling us about Hama'at, that you're the smallest of all the nations, it's not an insult. And it's not bad news as if to say, listen, guys, you have to know you're in for a rough ride. As the expression in the Talmud, you're just one sheep surrounded by these 70 wolves. And a lot of our history has kind of proven that. But the truth is that there's two different kinds of technology at work over here. There's the technology of the rest of the world. And then there's the technology of us. And when you understand the technology that we operate on as Jewish people, then you recognize that Atomic energy is actually not so new. It's perhaps new in the scientific world, but it's key to how we operate and how we have always been. Go back in history. One of the most incredible showdowns in the whole of Jewish history has to be the moment of the meeting of the two brothers, the two famous but completely different brothers who came face to face after many years of not seeing each other, you know who I'm talking about, Yaakov and Esav, two polar opposite individuals, let's be honest. Yaakov is what they would call in colloquial Hebrew, Yeled Tov Yerushalayim. Good guy, he doesn't make too much trouble, sits quietly, learns the whole day, very sincere, very dedicated to all the right ideals, and then he's got a big bully brother. Hairy guy, red hair, aggressive personality, really troublesome individual. And they, they have a couple of clashes <laughs> over the course of time. Clashes over who's the firstborn, which is an important discussion because firstborn really means who takes primacy in the world. Even before they were born, the prophet told their mother, Rivka, who was worried, sick about the kind of child that she had inside of her, not realizing it was twins, and thought that she had some crazy mixed up kid. And the prophet says, no, there's two different children, in fact, not children, nations, in fact, not nations, superpowers, and they will always be at loggerheads. Kind of like the Cold War. And these two superpowers, when one rises, the other must fall. That's the nature of their relationship. Esav, who is belligerent, aggressive, powerful. Yaakov, who is sincere, spiritual, connected. And they're going to fight. Yaakov, as the sages call him, Hakoton. The small guy. He's small, understated, not going to make a big noise, not going to go out conquering the world in the conventional sense. And so they run into all kinds of issues until eventually at the point where Yaakov gets the blessings that Esav believed were for him. Then it's serious fallout and Esav wants to kill him and Yaakov has to run away. And they don't see each other again for two and a half decades at least. And then when they meet, something interesting happens. They both kind of show their colors. 
in the course of their conversation. Esav turns to his brother. Vayoimer Esav, yesh li rav. Esav says to Yaakov, yesh li, I have rav. Rav basically means a lot. You look at the commentaries and they'll tell you effectively what he was saying is, I have more and more and even more. Because that's Esav's attitude. Esav's attitude is the bigger, the louder, the wider, the greater, the more powerful, the more flashy, the better. So you look at Esav's descendants, whether they are his direct genealogical descendants or his ideological descendants, and you see that they always have the same attitude. Yeshli Rav, I have much. We build empires. We build colonies. We go to war and we conquer. We show might, we show power, we show prowess, we show innovation. We make our empire great. That's the language of Esav. Yesh li rav. And Yaakov says to him quite timidly actually, he says, Yesh li kol. Which basically means, I have everything that I need. Before we entered the atomic age, any weapons race, any conflict, any war was built on Yeshli Rav. I have more hardware than you have. So if you have 10,000 troops, I'll tell you I have 15,000 troops. And if your troops have spears and swords, we'll bring bows and arrows. And if you come at us with cavalry, we'll invent cannons. And then you'll come back with tanks and we'll respond with bombing airplanes. Yeshli Rav. The bigger the bomb, bunker busters, the faster the army can move, the stronger the tank, that's who's going to win the war. And Yaakov says, and we as Jews have echoed this throughout the whole of history, yesh li kol, I have everything that I need within. I don't have to amass these mega weapons, hayodayim yedei Esav, the belligerent hands of Esav that are always looking to pick a fight. We have kol, kol, yak, we've got a voice, and our voice expresses it in itself in such a way that we've got everything we need inside of ourselves. And so in something really interesting happens. Those grand empires, they build, they conquer, they reach a climax, and then they fall hard. Vayimloich vayomos, the Torah says. They rule and collapse, rule and collapse. That's Esav's descendants' histories. They've always built themselves with such incredible might, and, but when they fall, they pretty much fall off the map. That's why there are no Romans running around today, or Spanish conquistadors, or Nazis. Because when they fall, they fall absolutely. And the impact that they have had does create some kind of a crater in history. But then they die. There's a magnificent interview that Jewish Educational Media, Jem, did. It was Rabbi David Lappin, who some of you will remember here from South Africa. And he tells the story that in 1976, he was torn. He was very, very involved in building a community. He was the rabbi of a shul community. He built a base medrash, a Torah study hall. And in addition to that, he was involved in business as well. And he believed quite strongly that the business was good. It was good because it added uh, financially, so he didn't have to be a burden on the community. And it also gave him an opportunity to interact with people who wouldn't necessarily come into the shul or to, into the yeshiva environment. And so they, these were two equal passions that he had, and, and both of them he felt were really important, but they were draining him completely. And he reached a point where he felt that his family was actually taking the, uh, the, the brunt of his experience. And so in 1976, he had the opportunity to visit the Rebbe. And he went into Yechidus, he went into a personal audience, and he tells the story himself. And he was talking to the Rebbe about the dilemma that he had. What should he leave? Should he leave the business world or should he leave the rabbinate in order to do what it is that he had to do? And he doesn't tell us exactly what the Rebbe said to him, other than the fact that by the end of it, he felt that the Rebbe was actually adding more responsibility to his plate instead of giving him an exit strategy, which is really what he was looking for. So at some point, he was frank and candid with the Rebbe, and he said, I, I don't think I can do this. I really don't think I can handle all of the expectations. At which point the Rebbe said to him, your difficulty, you'll notice that the Rebbe wouldn't use a word like your problem. He says, your difficulty is that you believe that interpersonal relations are like a regular 
chemical compound where you have an effect between one chemical and the next chemical. And, and it's a limited kind of range of impact. Instead, the Rebbe said, you have to realize that when you interact with another person, when you engage with another person, that is a nuclear reaction. And he explained that a nuclear reaction means that there's a central sphere that has a tremendous amount of power. And because of that, it explodes outwards in all directions with an incredible force. And if you think about it, that's such a profound insight. You explode outwards with incredible force in all directions. We tend so often to limit ourselves and to say, yes, I only have so much resources. I only have so much time. I only have so much talent. Yes, I have a lot, but it's limited. And Yaakov, whose voice the Rebbe echoes in this conversation, says, yes, I have everything that I need to have the most incredible impact. Because I don't have to have an impact in the way of building empires as Asaph does because the empires that are built are destined to fall. Instead, I'm the atom of society that's constantly influencing. And if we go back to Mark Twain and his comment about being less than one quarter of the world's population, true. But the impact that we have had on the world, every single place that we have gone on our many journeys around the world has always been nuclear. We have always punched above our weight category. We've always had an influence on the world, not just because we produce people like Einstein and Freud, but because we embedded ourselves inside the atomic substructure of every single civilization so that they started to adopt Torah values, the value of human life, the need for a healthy justice system, the drive for welfare and looking out for the well-being of the next person. Those are Jewish values that we allow to sink into the invisible underside, the inside, the core of every single thing and every single person that exists. That's nuclear energy. What's fascinating about the power of the atom, it's not that the atom is tiny. That's not the point. The point is that the atom is the basic building block of every single thing. Which means two things. Firstly, it means that if I can create a chain reaction at the atomic level, then it's something that can affect everything. If I'm using conventional weapons, the ASAP style, trying to strangle the world into obedience, well, I can only control those people that are within arm's length. I can only control those people that live in my empire. I can only control those people that I've colonized. But if I have nuclear energy, yeshli kol, I have everything that I need inside of myself, that means that I can change the whole world literally, simultaneously. It's very interesting because if you think, this is the second point, if you think about atoms, they're the common denominator of every single thing that exists. You go right down to that level and you will see that we're all made up out of particles. And it's the same particles that live inside you are the same particles that live inside me, which happen to be the same particles that live inside every single thing that we can identify. Perhaps they're structured together in a different way, but it's the same particles. Meaning to say that if you go nuclear, you start to recognize that actually the whole world has a singular oneness to it. The Ramba Maimonides says that the purpose of giving the Torah was to empower people that we should be able to visualize in our minds the oneness of God. That the entire world is a singular truth and a singular reality. Yeshli kol, here in my little space, whatever it is that I'm doing is plugged into every single thing that exists. This is nuclear energy on a whole different level. I mean, the theory of the nuclear energy Chain reaction is exactly that. This particle impacts that particle, which impacts the next particle, and it grows exponentially and everything changes. But the reason for it is because they all have something in common. They're all particles. And it's exactly the same concept that we have as Jewish people and understanding that it's not just about the fact that I meet a guy and I buy him a pair of tzitzis and then I see him again 15 years later and it's changed his whole life. But it's about the things I don't see. Because atomic power operates at a level that I don't see. Perhaps that's the reason why when Hashem tells Abraham that he's going to have this magnificent nation as his descendants, he says, your children will be like the stars. Like the stars. And yes, it does say, that we'll be 
the mount of the stars, which we're still waiting for. And please God, when Mashiach comes, we'll see that brocha. But what is a star? Isn't it fascinating? The more we learn of the scientific perspective on life, the more insight we actually have to what the Torah has to say. What is a star? What are all of these stars? They're effectively massive natural nuclear reactors. There's this atomic fusion happening inside every one of these stars to generate this incredible energy, the kind of energy that can sustain an entire planet, like in the case of our sun. That's what Hashem tells Abraham. He says, your children are stars. Your children have the power to impact in an atomic fashion. It's a teaching from the Rambam, Maimonides, and the Rebbe would very frequently, very frequently quote it. And it's in the laws of Teshuvah. Most people translate Teshuvah as repentance, but the truth is that Teshuvah really means a return to your truth, to your core, to your essence, to the invisible part of who you are, getting down to your spiritual subatomic reality, the place where you actually converge with all the other spiritual atoms around you. So he says in the laws of Teshuvah, he says, at every moment a person has to view themselves as if they're in perfect balance. Perfect balance between what's right and what's wrong, what's healthy, what's toxic, what's good and what's the opposite. And equally imagine that the entire world is just as equally balanced. If you had to take everybody's actions and decisions and put them onto some kind of a scale, the entire world is in perfect balance. And therefore, says the Rambam, your next choice, your next choice has the power to tip the scales that you and the entire world, in his words, you bring Yeshua v'hatzola loy ulechol ha'olam kuloi. That you bring salvation to yourself and to the whole world. Now, the average person thinks, great, that's all I needed. Another element of Jewish guilt. Like we don't have enough on our plate already. I have to now feel responsible for the entire world. It's not a negative thing. It's not a guilt thing. What he's telling us is that you have the power to launch an atomic bomb. Just as Pearl Harbor, it's not Pearl Harbor, just as Hiroshima decisively ended the Second World War. Okay, maybe if you're a history buff, you'll say Nagasaki was the one who did it. In the same way as you decisively end the conflict, our next move literally has the nuclear power to end the conflict that we've faced for 2,000 years between dark and light, between good and evil, between what is healthy and what is antithetical to godliness. Our next move. And so what the Rebbe has empowered us to understand and what we should all think about, every single one of us in our own minds, is that I am nuclear. Just like, theoretically, if somebody had access to the launch codes for a nuclear missile, they wouldn't necessarily have to know how the missile works in order for it to work. Just like 9 out of 12 of the Enola Gay's crew had no idea what they were doing and what kind of a weapon they carried, but still it did its job. It makes no difference if we carry the title rabbi, shliach, chabadnik, whatever title you believe that you have to have to make a difference, it's irrelevant. We have the nuclear codes. We have Hashem's way, His menu, His guidebook. Do this, and you could be the catalyst. Your next move, my next move, our next move, that could be the catalyst to complete the chain reaction that arms Hashem's weapon to, in a nuclear way, totally change our world. When a nuclear bomb goes off, everybody tells you there's a magnificent, incredible light. It's, it's in an ironic sense beautiful, even though it's this incredible devastation that's about to happen. And when you ignite Hashem's nuclear bomb that lives inside every single one of us, it's only the light and the end to devastation. Please God, every single one of us today, tomorrow, makes a choice to be a catalyst, to launch a nuclear weapon for a better world, the world of Moshiach, who we pray for every single day. And please God, we can join hands in a chain reaction to make him and that world a reality now. Thank you very much.